For now, we have the chance and the great opportunity to welcome Christian Clot. For more than 20 years, the French Swiss explorer researchers Christian Clot has dedicated himself to the exploration and scientific research. He has mounted expeditions in all types of terrains, from the sea to the mountains, from forests to deserts, questioning the interaction between environments and the capacity of humans to adapt to changing conditions and crises. He has achieved several world firsts, such as being the first person to penetrate the central part of the Cordilla Darwin mountain and successfully crossing the four most extreme environments on the planet. I highly encourage you to listen to the podcast about this very important experience. Following several experiences of crisis situations, he developed a program of observation of crisis situations in 2005 in partnership with La Maison des Sciences et Université Paris 13. In 2014, he extended his studies by creating the Human Adaptation Institute, whose flagship projects are Deep Time, Deep Climate, and Les Voies de la Liberté. He studies in an innovative way human conditions and physiology, physiology in the face of change the new environmental situation in real life situations. He is vice president of the Society of French Explorers. He has written and directed several books and films, gives conferences for different audiences. Main book, Deep Time, 40, 40 days under, um, under the terrain, under the field, actually, sous terre. Essay, COVID et après, our new terra incognita and many other things, notably some films, adaptations, Quatre fois trente jours au cœur des extrêmes, la trace des hommes au cœur des tempêtes. Christian, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. It's a great honor. It's a, not a, exactly an adventure to come on stage, but we are very pleased to welcome you warmly. Thank you very much, Christian. Well... Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I don't know what to say now. You, you know everything, so it's okay. Uh, so yeah, my job is a bit special because I go all over the world to try to study human being in new kind of living situations. So I had the opportunity to go all over the kind of environment the Earth is uh, on. Uh, so for example, in the rainforest, in the polar area, in deserts. Uh, Place is interesting. For example, uh, here we are in the desert in Dartelut in Iran. It's a plus 58 degrees under shadow. So it's plus 80 under sun. That is interesting because if you swallow some water, it will be evaporated before reaching the belly. So you can't cool your body. How do you do that? Uh, in Pakistan, they had plus 50 degrees last year. So they, are, they were in this situation, unable to cool the body. So that is really a question we need to answer now, how, we, how you can do and work when you are under 50 degrees. This is a kind of situation I'm in, and of course, usually these expeditions are with a group of people, and I build and design expedition to study human being facing new kind of living conditions, like in deep time situation, we, we were 15 in a cave without any time information, to try to understand how the brain is able to understand time, which is the, the most important thing in the world. I mean, everything you will do in your life will be a timetable. You, have, you will have meeting, you will have ring up in the morning, you will have a lot of information. All that is time. What happens when you just put away time information? That is interesting for the brain and the way of a human being and a, a society can work because you can't uh, say to someone, hey guy, tomorrow we meet at 8 and we will work for 2 hours. That is not possible. So how can you organize a new society when you put time away? Uh, other kind of situation, I, put, uh, I went with uh, 20 persons, 10 women and 10 men in three different kind of climate situation uh, in desert, rainforest, polar area to understand what would be the kind of climate we will have in the future. So we uh, work in exact the kind of climate we will have in 2050 uh, and to see what happens when you face uh, plus 45 with a group, uh, minus uh, 30, a uh, huge storm. Uh, rainforest, all this kind of situation we will live in some, in some years in our countries. So that is the kind of, of study I run. And of course, I also study and work with, uh, unfortunately, people who experience tsunami, earthquake, uh, avalanche, this kind of situation when, unfortunately, in a minute, you lose everything. 
again will happen. How can you adapt to this new situation and find solutions in a crisis situation? Of course, my expeditions has three things that are always true. First thing, I organize everything. All is prepared. I learn a lot. I know everything I have to know before reaching uh, the country I will work in. Uh, you, do, you will do the same in your, in your life. You will prepare everything. And then you will go in the field. And you will have to do with what you have. All you prepared won't work as you think. It will always be different. Whatever you prepare, whatever you know, will be different when you will be in your real project in the field, in the new situation, in, your, in the new living conditions. So the changes are something really important in my life. Sometimes I don't know what will happen in a minute. For example, uh, we were in a Darwin Ranch uh, situation. It's a, it's a range of mountain in the, uh, the end of South America. And one time we had a storm, 200 kilometers per hour wind, 150 decibels. It's awful. We just jump in a tent. It was a small one for one person. We were free inside. And the storm lasts for 13 days. During 13 days, we had 250 kilometers wind, no food, no possibility to go outside of the tent, 150 decibels in the brain, which is beyond uh, what you can um, behave. And what do you do there with your two friends? If you want to try, you take two friends, a small room, a lot of noise inside, and you wait for 13 days without eating anything. You will see that it's interesting what happened there. I have a kind of situation, we were in Spitsbergen, it's 1,000 kilometers uh, north of uh, Norway, and we were with a team of scientists, we were eight of us, uh, and for 30, 15 days we do some science, we work on the field, it was really interesting, and after 15 days we, we succeed at what we were uh, heading for, it was really, we were really happy, so we were heading back to the base camp, uh, chatting, laughing, happy, a bit not really uh, concerned about what happened surrounding us, and suddenly, just in front of us, 10 meters far from us, a polar bear rays. Again, this is what I call a change. I mean, you are with friends or colleagues, chatting, laughing, happy, and suddenly, in a minute, you are facing death. Because these animals, I really like him, I mean, it's a nice animal, but it's also 500 pounds of muscle, he can run at 50 kilometers per hour, he can smell something at 60 kilometers, so if you want to avoid him, you can't, what do you do? And this polar bear is not happy, because you just awake him. The question is, you are a group of eight persons. You have one hour to think about that. What is your action and reaction? How can you change in a second your way of thinking? That is the kind of questions I try to understand. And it's why we work a lot on these kind of situation. And of course, when you are in, uh, in the field, it's just a parenthesis, but uh, you see a lot of things. We are here in Patagonia. It's a big maze of channels, more than 10,000 kilometers of channels. And a lot of places, no boat can go there. You just can go there with kayaks. And at the end of some fjord, you see a lot of plastic uh, where no human being have ever been. That is a true reality, too. All the plastic we, we have in the ocean will end at this kind of places. And for example, this is Nepal uh, two years ago. And you have so much plastic, so much pollution in the field, on the ground, that you just even don't know what to do. And they even can't grow up anything from the land because the land is so much full of plastic, they can't do anything with that. That is also the kind of things we see when we are in the field. And of course, unfortunately, I work also a lot with migrants who have to leave their country without any desire of doing this, of course. And again, needed to go from a place to another place and find a new way to live. And again, something that is quite hard to do. So we run some st scientific study about brain issue, about all these situations to try to understand what are the mechanisms of adaptation when you are facing these kind of changes. And changes is something really important. We can consider it as we want, but uh, every kind of person in this room, every kind of person in the world will have to change what they have in the next decades. Could be a tsunami could be this little farm 
in, South, in North Africa, where 100 persons were living there, with a nice place to grow up some, uh, it was a crop, I don't know, I don't remember what. And I went there just two years ago again, and this is the place. How these people can live? That's a question we have to ask. So yes, changes are here. If we consider changes, there are three kind of categories we can class every kind of changes. First of all, it's environment. You know that, climate change, pollution, all these kind of things will change our living in the future. Second kind of changes we can have is technologies. So of course, because technologies change, we have to change. It can be uh, because of uh, ChatGPT, of course, but uh, before it was a cell phone, before it was plain. All these changes change our life and accelerate it. The third reason to change is a social system. Because uh, of war, because of, syst of uh, working system changing, or because, uh, you know, uh, we were increasing the women rights in the world during decades, and now suddenly we go back. And for example, in the United States, they decided again to uh, consider abortion come uh, a, crime, a crime. So this is things that change a lot. All these kind of changes, environment, social, and technologies, already appeared in our, our life, in our human's life since centuries. But it is the first time ever that these three changes appear in the same time. Meaning that all what we knew about changes is not true anymore. Because during centuries, in fact, changes appear slowly. We have a new thing, we had the time to adapt, a new changes, again, time to adapt. Sometimes a war, it's awful, but it ends on, it goes back to normal. Quite a normal pace of changes. Now, because these three changes come in the same time, things will change faster and much more bigger. That is us now, as human beings. We will need to change completely the way we consider changes and we consider the way we can change. We need to be quite, in a way, a human 2.0. But what is this human 2.0? That is a great question. And it's a question you have to ask for yourself, but we all have to ask that. How will we do to face such an amount of changes in such small time? That is a question of brain. You all have a brain. I hope so, at least. You all have the ability to think. And we all live in the same place in the world. There's no question of living in France, in uh, Singapore, in States, in uh, Saudi Arabia, or else. We all on the same Earth. And we all have just one Earth. There's no planet B, we know that. We may go to space, but nobody will live on, on Moon, nobody will live on Mars. We live on Earth. And we will need to do something. I have a question to ask you. Are you breathing right now? Yes, I hope. Are you thinking? I hope too. So you are alive, all of you, all of us. As long as we are alive, this earth, life on earth, life for human being is not over. All you hear about the abilities we will have to change things, to save words, to save biodiversity, to save climate change, is just a question of decision. As long as we are alive, we are able to do something. But we will have to change our way of thinking. And I think that this earth we knew so well is now a bit more like when Magellan, 500 years ago, knew the world. When Magellan decided to explore the world, we knew that. A bit of uh, Europe, Asia, some Africa, small place of uh, Atlantic Ocean, and nothing more in Europe. 
And when Magellan went to the king of Portugal asking for boats to go to explore a bit beyond what Columbus discovered, the king of Portugal answered that, Mr. Magellan, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. We know everything about everything. We are 500 years ago. We have this knowledge of the world. And these persons think, in reality, that they knew everything. And that is the worst thing we can do as human beings, thinking that we know. They knew nothing at this time, but they were absolutely sure they knew everything. That's the biggest mistake we can make, and it's the biggest mistake usually we all do. It's considering that we know. We don't know so much. And in fact, nobody, not in this room, not anywhere on the world, someone know what to do to change the climate change. It will be something we will have to create. We will have to be all Magellan, taking some boats. And what did Magellan? He went to Spain, and he had some boats, five of them. And he just discovered Pacific Ocean, a small thing, because he decided to be an explorer. He decided that he can't accept that we know everything but that he has to go to try to find a new ID, new place, new knowledge. Being an explorer is not the best thing we can have to try to complete the journey we will have now to try to create a new world. The new world where all the life, your life, the life of biodiversity is possible. Yet, what do we need for that? If I tell you that this morning in the newspaper, you, will, you, you could have read a small, a small article about an avalanche in Chimborazo that erased completely the base camp, killing the 10 persons inside. Does it touch you? Do you know where is Chimborazo? Maybe not. It's just an information. You even may consider that, well, it's a base camp, it's a guy that decided to go there, so it's not so bad. It's life. Yes, it's true. It's not so important for you. It won't change your life, right? Now consider the same base camp, the same avalanche, the same situation. But in the base camp, you have your brother, your sister, or your parent. Suddenly, this very same avalanche that is not so important for you before, will change your life. This is important to remember. We can't understand a situation, whatever it is, so big it is, if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, take something in our emotion. There's only one solution to understand a new conditions, a new situation, is emotions. Emotions are the key. In fact, we prove that any decision you take in your life is based on an emotion. Never forget that your emotions, what you feel, love, fear, anywhere, any, anything else, will create your abilities to take decisions. Never consider that your emotions are not important. Never believe people that you can take a cold, simple decision. That doesn't exist. Any decision are based on your emotions. When you work here in Essex or anywhere else, never put your emotions away. It doesn't mean that your emotions has a stick on you, but you have to consider every time your emotions. That's the first key you can have to deal with the new consideration for the future. Then you have to take decisions, of course. And this is an image of the brain, in fact. Uh, you have a brain. It's uh, like a mountain, you have a lot of information, uh, so, so, some snow, some things, and you have signals. And in fact, during your whole life, and during uh, the study you will do, you will create signals, things you know without any need of energy. Because you know it perfectly, you don't need energy in your brain to use it. For example, to walk, I don't have to think about it. If I decide to walk, I walk. And I don't need energy because I know how to do that. What causes a changes, a huge changes in your life, is to cut off the signals. For some time, you are disappointed. 
you don't have a solution to apply directly to the new situation you're living. If you try to apply a normal signals, it won't work because it doesn't respond to the new situation. And you will need to create a new path, a new way, a new knowledge. And that, it's difficult. It asks for courage. Each time you hear that changing is easy, you just have to do that or this. You just have to apply some rules. You just have to try things. It's not true. Changing, going from a point you know and you love to another point you don't know and you will have to create a new life, it's a hard way for anybody. So it's OK to consider that it's difficult, to consider that you don't want to do it, to consider that finally you prefer to stay where you are. But we don't have any choice now. We can't stay where we are. We have to create something. We have to do the hard way and to try to understand that this is another, another peak I went on. It's a Stanley peak. It's in the Darwin Range again. And this peak is very special because nobody never see the top. It's always cloudy. It's always impossible to know what was there because there's so much cloud there. And it's an image of our future. We know we have to go there. We know we have to climb this mountain, but we don't know what we will have and we will find. So it's a bit tricky because the way you will create, the path you will do, you don't know where you go with. But you have to. And this is something very important. The question is, will you accept this situation or not? Will you fight the new situation you're against? For example, if it rains outside since one or two days or three days, it's raining, you don't like rain, and you go outside and you say, oh shit, it's raining again. It's the worst thing you can do. Because you are fighting something you don't have any leverage on. You can't stop the rain. You can be angry, not happy, whatever. It won't stop the rain. So each time you fight something you don't have a leverage on, you use energy for nothing. So the first thing you have to do with a situation is acceptation. Not because you are getting away or you decided that it's too big, but because you will consider the situation exactly as it is, exactly as it is. During 13 days in a tent, we were lying in the tent. If we try to fight the, the wind or whatever, it won't work. We have to accept the wind and to consider what the leverage we can have on it. What can I do at my level? Not the level of other people, not level that I can't reach, but what is my leverage? What can I do at my point? We always think that others have to solve the problem. And now we hear a lot that if government doesn't do nothing, I can't do nothing. It may be true in a way that, of course, we can't change everything if government doesn't take in charge. But it's true also if that we wait for government or others to solve all the problem, it won't work because we all have something to do at our level with our leverage. We have a role on these changes. And this role is to be leaders, not because we are boss or I don't know what, but because we decide to try to do something at the leverage we have. And that is really important because that need to try to consider that there's something to do. It's a conquest spirit, but of course the conquest spirit is not to, to put a flag on the top of a, of a peak and to consider I'm the best. Of course not. A conquest spirit now, sorry, is really the imagination. How Magellan can explore the world if he can first imagine that there's something to be explored. Your imagination is the key, the first key, to consider you can build something in the future. And with imagination, I can think about the kind of peak I will find, the place I will go. When you will reach it, it won't be like that. But it doesn't matter. Because of imagination, you decided to try and to go there. Then, of course, we have a problem about that. More you are focused on the way you want to do, on the thing you want to do, more you are focused on the imagination you, will, you need, the more you will need from resilience. Each time you have a changes, you need to adjust 
and to go to resilience. And usually, a lot of persons consider that if you are resilient, it's okay, it's enough. You have a situation, you go beyond the situation, you, you use resilience, you finally go to stabilization, so you are okay, you are fine, and it could be enough. Then it's not true again. Why? Because resilience just responds to a crisis that did happen before. You have a situation, you use resilience, you stabilize, stabilize yourself, and you're happy. But it never helps you to prepare something and to change yourself, to change your behavior before a situation appears. And the question is, what can we do for the future for, to avoid the climate change or as a disaster of biodiversity if we wait the situation to appear? We need to change something in our behavior before the situation appears. This is anticipation, and basically, this is adaptation. Adaptation is the ability you have to project an idea, a desire future, and you will work to create it. Don't wait for the situation to come, but create the situation as you consider it important. Doing that, you may enter in what we call a tunnel effect. And this tunnel effect is because you are so focused on what you want, what you want to change, what you consider for right, you are not able to consider the whole picture. If you just want to, to solve the climate change without solving biodiversity, without solving technology issues, social issues, you won't succeed. So you need to consider the whole picture and not only one situation. But the thing is, this situation like climate change is so concerning, it creates a lot of fear. We consider, I hope it's not your case, but 58% of teenagers are afraid of the future. And I can understand that. The thing is, more you are afraid, less you try to find solution. Maybe some of you, I don't know, fear some spiders. The question is for the persons fearing spiders is, how many times have it been attacked by spiders? Not so many times. That's the question we fear. We usually fear things we do not understand, and because of that, we don't try to fight it. And we let things a bit away. We push it away. We don't like to see our fear. But as I told you before, emotions are the key for decisions. And fear is the biggest emotions you will ever feel. Each time you fear something, try to understand why. Try to understand what is the thing that really fear you and work on it. Learn to fight it. Learn to understand it. Learn to go beyond. It will give you a really, really good strength to take the right decision. I consider myself to be alive after quite 30 years of expeditions in hard conditions because I fear a lot. And this is something that helped me, helped me a lot because each time I fear something, I try to understand why, to learn things, to build a new situation, and to go beyond. Emotions are your best friends to find solutions. Now, we need three things to create the future. We need, in fact, a lot of others, a lot, a lot, a lot of things. But if these three things lack, there's no way we will succeed. So first thing, I learned it in the cave with my friends, 15, 15 uh, persons in a cave for 40 days. We were in a cave in the dark, without time information, completely lost. We don't knew each other, each of them, and uh, it was really a tricky situation. After 10 days, we were completely lost, unable to understand what happened, and, uh, and we were really uh, considering about how, how can we survive here. And so we began to talk a bit more together, to spend more time together. And finally, I decided that we will all sit and began to talk and to explain from where we are. I mean, not only I'm coming from France and I'm I, I living in Paris, but who I am, me, as a person. What, is my, what are my fears? What are uh, the things I like, I love? What are the people I'm, I'm good with or I don't know what? This is what I call cooperation. 
You know, we talk a lot about collaboration now. We need to collaborate. You are in group, you will create a project, it's really nice. But never forget that collaboration is just working together. Cooperation is one thing the others to succeed. Knowing the others, knowing what, what they are, what are their emotions, who are, they, who are these people. This is cooperation, the ability to work together and to consider that is as much important that I succeed than others succeed. The cooperation needs to avoid completely the idea that others are less important than me. It demands also to, to push away completely the idea that some people are responsible and I'm not responsible. We know now that anybody on earth has a responsibility to fight the future and to create it, to make a possible future. And we don't have to consider that young people are better than old ones or old ones are better than young people or that a person in Africa is less important or more important than a, per a person in, in Asia. We are all living on the same earth. More we cooperate, more we have a chance to create something because we will add all the brain we have on working together. Second thing very important is what I learned with the bear in, uh, in Spitsbergen when suddenly a bear raised in front of us. We were eight of us. Uh, I was here, I had four persons behind and three persons in the front of, of me. So I just let them, guys, stay here, all okay. Of course you can't do that. So what can you do if once a polar bear raised in front of you? There's a lot of theory, but when you are really in, a in front of a polar bear, you need to act really fast. And I just understand one thing, this polar bear is angry. He's not happy because he just wake up, and in a second, he will charge us. And if we panic, if we scream, if we give him a reason to be fear, he will charge us. So I have to show him that, well, we don't really fear him, and he's not a problem, and that we are a bit stronger than him, and we don't care about him. How can I do that? I have only one solution. First of all, to group my team, to create a, a big core, a big body, but it's not enough. We will have to walk in the direction of the polar bear, to show him that we don't fear him. Yet, tell your friends, hey guys, easy, we will walk in the direction of the polar bear. It will be nice. It won't work at all. There's only one solution to do that, not two, one. Before speaking, before telling my people we will walk in the direction of the polar bear, I will have to walk myself, to put myself in, in the middle of the polar bear on my team. Then tell them, go behind me, raise your hand, and we will walk in the direction of the polar bear together. If I had did the opposite, if I had talked before acting, nobody would have done it. The notion of trust, what we talk a lot, give me trust, trust me, all these kind of things, is never something that you can ask by talking. It's only something you can show. Show people that can trust you and trust the people that show you something instead of talking, and you will see that things will be really easy together. So we need cooperation, and in this cooperation, we, mu we must to trust others. And then we need the last thing. So last time I went in Darwin Ranch, I was alone, and I decided to try to find a new way. So I was in a fjord like that, trying to find a place to disembark and to begin my expedition, and I was with a small zodiac like that, trying to uh, find a place to disembark and find a way. And suddenly, at this very time, a, a wind called a willy woo came. A willy woo is 300 kilometers per hour wind. It's like uh, something that hit you. So it, it, hit, it hit me hard, and I fall down in the, in the water, and my zodiac were uh, take by the storm on go away, uh, 100 meters far away. So I was in the water, uh, two degrees water, 
without any special clothes. And in, in this kind of situation, in this kind of cold, you have five minutes to survive. After that, all uh, uh, med uh, doctors will tell you that you will die. Five minutes. And I watch surrounding me, and the first coast was one kilometer far from me. My zodiac was 500 meters far from me, impossible to reach it in five minutes. So basically, I was, I was dead. And in fact, I was in a bad situation there. So I tried to, to swim a bit. But it was awful. I mean, swimming in the five degree, in the two degrees water, I tried it, but after five minutes, obviously, it was impossible. I, I, I was trying, and my, my muscle won't respond, and I was trying to fight. And, and finally, my brain, it was so painful. My brain said to my body, stop it. Stop it. It's not worth it. And then the storm that was lasting on uh, go away and suddenly open uh, a bit the clouds in the sky. And I saw something really surprising. It's uh, something like that. It was like exactly a painting I saw in New York. This painting is called Le Bateau dans la Tempête uh, from William Turner, uh, The Boat in a Storm, William Turner. And it's a really nice uh, painting of a storm, and I really saw that in, in the sky. It was a craziness. And I remember something. I, I remember this painting. I remember the place I saw this painting. It was in New York, in the Met. And I remember the person I was with when I saw this, this painting, the person I deeply love. And my brain tell my body, you can't imagine not seeing this person anymore. Swim. And I swim. And I spent 20 minutes in the water. I had a GoPro at this time, so I know exactly the time I spent. I spent 20 minutes. Even now, when I tell that to the doctors, they, don't, they won't believe me, because it's, on the paper, impossible. Not because I'm stronger or better than anybody else, but because I remember someone I love seeing a painting in the sky. We never know what we will use in a in a tricky situation. All your experiences, all your curiosity, all what you learn may not be useful at a very time point, but will be useful once in your life. But more than that, marvelousness on love is a key, absolutely important in consideration of adaptation. In fact, it may be the more important thing in your life. Why? Your brain is something marvelous. The brain is a better machine the world ever, ever invented. Fine. Yet, the brain has a difficulties. It uses a lot of energy. Each time you think, each time you take a decision, your brain uses energy, a lot. At the end of the day, if you have work a lot, do a lot of things, uh, your brain is a bit tired. And then you face a new situation at this very moment, if you face a new situation when you are tired, your brain has two solutions. Trying the hard way to find a solution to calculate, to do the math, and to uh, imagine new, a new situation, or to take the easy one. And because it's tired, because it doesn't have enough energy, it will take the easy one. It's when my, my brain tells my body, stop it, it's too painful. And there's two solutions to help your brain to be a bit less tired after a hard day or a hard situation. First, to sleep. Well, it's sometimes difficult when we are really tired, when we are under fear, when we are not so well. It's hard to sleep and you won't sleep well. And when it's 30 degrees, for example, in a room, you can't sleep, your brain can't sleep. But we know now a new situation where the brain can a bit be in a better shape and solve a new problem is when you are under full pleasure. When you have pleasure, when you are feeling nice thing, when you are experiencing new situation you love, your brain do exactly the same as when he's sleeping. He repair it, he wash it, he give new energy in the brain. So you can't imagine Create new ideas or new situations only with the fear and the difficulties. 
you need the opposite emotion. And the opposite emotion is oneness and love. That is the best key you will have. If you can create cooperation, if you trust the people you are in, in a project, you are involved in a project, and if you have enough pleasure and hope, you may solve quite any kind of problem you will face, even climate change, because we will do it all together. The worst thing we can do now in our life is considering that the future is just darkness, difficulties, and pain. You won't fight all your life for that. You will fight and create new ideas and new exploration if you consider that something is nice enough to fight for. The wonderness, the wonderness you can create is the best tool you will have in your life. This is something you can just wait. You maybe sometimes will have some nice thing in your life and you will be happy. Or it's something you can try, try to create each time, each day of your life. Try to find on each situation, each moment, even the, the baddest one, something you can love. If you can do that, I promise you, nothing will be impossible for you. So now, we have a bit, uh, I will pass a bit quickly, bit like this. it's not important, but you have a bit two solutions now. Considering the future as some people describe us, an impossibility, something that is even too late now and we, you will have a lot of problems. Something maybe ideal, perfect, because technologies will solve everything and you will have a perfect situation in the future. We won't have neither one or the other. The only thing you will have in the future is if you can cooperate and work with everybody on Earth, even people you dislike, even people you won't be with normally, but to consider that even if you dislike someone, you can cooperate with and do something with. And if we do that, if we work all together, and if we take in charge at our own level, the leverage we have, there's nothing impossible for the future. That is the challenge we all have. It will be hard. It will be interesting. But it will make us all explorers of the, of the future. It's what I ask you. Be your own explorer of your own future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, we're going to welcome the students on stage, the ones who prepared the question, please. Would you please join us? Thank you. My question was about change, because you talked a lot about it. And it was, when you were our age, did you imagine your life as it looks now? And how did you encounter all the changes in your personal life? Uh, not at all. When, you, when I was your age, I was completely um, uh, considering that everything was impossible. Uh, I wanted to be an explorer when I was your age. I, in fact, since I'm four years old, I have the idea I want to discover things. I don't know why. I don't have any explanation of that. And um, when I was uh, 15, 16, I don't know exactly the, the age, I read a, an article in the newspaper saying that we know anything of, about everything. So we, we know all, and there's nothing more to be explored. And it was something I read, and I think, wow, my life is done. I mean, all I, I wanted to do is impossible, because there's no exploration anymore. And during 10 years, in fact, I did something different. I, I, I went to do different things. And I was really uh, considering that I don't have anything to do on, on my life. And it was a stupidness. I mean, um, 
I began to, to, to explore, I mean, to, to travel, and I went to Nepal. And uh, it was at uh, the end of the uh, century, last, last century. And I went in Nepal, in the west of Nepal. And I met some persons who never had met any white person. And they, they never had seen a zip, for example. So I built my tent, and the people was coming, all the village come to try to open and close the zip of my tent. It was so new for them. So I think, wow, these persons, they don't know me, and I don't know them. And uh, it's stupid. So every, anybody tell me that we know everything, but these people, I don't know them, and they don't know me. So I consider that, no, exploration is still possible. And it really creates something important to me that to consider that I will never anymore listen to people who tell me that something is impossible. So no, I was a bit afraid in your age, but no, I'm happy. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much for your very inspirational speech. It was a pleasure to listen to it. I wanted to ask you about, uh, on your uh, website of the Human Adaptation Institute, you mentioned about uh, behavioral adaptation. I was curious about in, when you have groups and you're in these extreme situations with the 40 days underground or in the desert or in the deep cold, what are the most impactful findings you have found of how people talk to each other, how people react in the most extreme of situations? Thank you. Well, yeah, I, it will ask a lot of time to answer that. The first thing is you can have the best tools, the best system, the best idea. At the end of the day, it's human being who solves the problem. I mean, it's the behavior of, of human being that is important. You may have the best boat with the best engine, with the best captain. If you can't help people to go in this boat and to, to sail with it, it doesn't it's not useful. So it's really a human being who has everything in the hand to solve problem. And when I was with my team uh, in the cave or in, in the extreme environment, a lot of time we had some, some material issues, some, some technical issues. And uh, sometimes people say, oh shit, it's done. We can't push you because we, 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 we break, uh, I don't know, the wheel or we break something and uh, we can't do it anymore. And no, we're here. We live, uh, we don't need this, we just have to do it differently. And there's always solutions if human being is okay to change their behavior and comportment to try to find a solution. Thank you very I, much. I never ever saw a situation unsolvable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and Hello. thank you for everything you said. Thank you. So my question was about uh, your impact in uh, exploration. So how do you think exploration uh, contributes to innovation in travel and uh, in the fight against global warming? Whoa. <laughs> again. <laughs> um, again, you know, nobody knows what we will need to create the future. Nobody knows what is worth it, unworth it, and what will, be, what, what will succeed or not. We need to seek. We need to seek everywhere with everybody. We need to meet people, to understand that people are living all over the world, trying to have a nice time, trying to laugh, trying to be a human being. When we we hear, when we read newspaper, and we, 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 we read the news, and, and we, we read that people are fighting over there, that Iranian people are bad people, that these people we don't want to work with. Uh, when we saw Russia attacking Ukraine and else, we can think that, wow, the world is so crap, and that people are not really interesting. And when you travel, you realize that most of the people just want to have a nice life and to, to consider other persons as persons and not as enemy. And we need to consider that meeting other people help us to understand that we all on the same boat, on the same earth, and we need, we need to work together. That is maybe the best thing I learned of my expeditions, is that nobody wants the worst, except maybe a really small amount of persons who are unable to understand what we are doing now. Secondly, well, you know, 
When you see the world, when you see glacier, rainforest, when you see all these things, it's a marvelness. It's places where you can cry just because you see a sunset or a sunrise. And when you see that, when you experience that, you know you have to do something to change. And emotions again, sensation as a key to change. If you just stay on a room watching TV or watching information, you won't have the strength to change. Go to see the world. I don't say take plane as much as you want. It's not true. But take plane if you need to go to see other persons, other countries, other environment, not just to go uh, to Cancun on holiday for one week. But if you see the, the world, if you see the countries, if you see people, you will know why we have to fight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Very thank informative. Thank you. I would like to discuss about your take in, in uh, creativity. So during your explorations, you probably had to come with creativity in order to solve problems, which is what I call personally creative problem solving. What would be your take in this? And do you believe that that creativity would come much more efficiently with the more you have experience or not? Well, that's a good question. I'm not so sure that the more experience you have, the more creative you are. In, the, in fact, even sometimes, the more you have experience, the more you believe you know. And when you believe you know, you are not creative anymore. Because when you know, you don't have to create something new. You have it. So it's really something that can maybe uh, avoid you to have a lot of creativity, to have a lot of experience. The more you have experience, the more you have to consider that you know nothing but you have always to consider new things. It's why, I, to me, it's so important to learn, and I try to learn every year new things, to see new things, to meet new people. Because each time you meet new people, you consider, wow, these people tell me some new things, and new visions, a new way of thinking. And it's really useful. So I don't think age or experiences are so much important in creativity. What is important in creativity is two things. First things, again, don't think you know. But try, always try. And when you succeed on something, put it away and try again. Because you may succeed a bit more with another idea. That's the first thing. The second thing is, again, consider your own leverage. What can I do at my level? Try things, do things, and act. So much people come to me to tell me, oh, I would like to, to do that, or I wish to do that. How can I do? And each time I tell, don't ask me, try something. It may not succeed, but on that, when you will come back to me with the thing you try, we will be able to build something on it. If I have nothing to build on, I can't be creative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much Thank you. For, your, for your talk.